JavaScript has been the exclusive language of the web browser for the last 20 years. Whether you use Chrome or Firefox or Internet Explorer or Safari, your browser interprets and executes code in a virtual machine, and that virtual machine only runs JavaScript. Unfortunately, JavaScript is not ideal for every task that we want to perform in the browser. Think about the use cases where you need to use software outside of the browser today. If you're like me, you do almost everything in the browser, except for things like video editing, music production, 3D art, video games. These applications require a high degree of performance that is hard to get from raw JavaScript. WebAssembly was created to get better performance on the web. WebAssembly allows code from other languages to be compiled and run in the browser. With WebAssembly, languages such as C, C++, and Rust can be used to achieve major performance gains. WebAssembly is still under development, and eventually more programming languages will be accessible as well. Lynn Clark is an engineer with Mozilla, and she's been working closely on the WebAssembly project. She's the author of a detailed series of illustrated blog posts that explains how WebAssembly works. In this episode, we discuss how WebAssembly came to be, and talk about its advantages over a web purely driven by JavaScript. We also explore what is possible with WebAssembly, as well as its engineering implementation in some granular detail. I really enjoyed this episode, and I am looking forward to doing more shows about WebAssembly in the future. Cloud computing can get expensive. If you're spending too much money on your cloud infrastructure, check out Doit International. Doit International helps startups optimize the costs of their workloads across Google Cloud and AWS so that the startups can spend more time building their new software and less time reducing their cost. Doit International helps clients optimize their costs. And if your cloud bill is over $10,000 per month, you can get a free cost optimization assessment by going to doit-intl.com slash se daily. That's doit-intl.com slash se daily. This assessment will show you how you can save money on your cloud. And Do It International is offering it to our listeners for free. They normally charge $5,000 for this assessment, but Do It International is offering it free to listeners of the show with more than $10,000 in monthly spend. And if you don't know whether or not you're spending $10,000, if your company is uh, that big, there's a good chance you're spending $10,000. So maybe go ask somebody else in the finance department. Do It International is a company that's made up of experts in cloud engineering and optimization. They can help you run your infrastructure more efficiently by helping you use commitments, spot instances, right sizing, and unique purchasing techniques. This to me sounds extremely domain specific, so it makes sense to me from that perspective to hire a team of people who can help you figure out how to implement these techniques. Do It International can help you write more efficient code, they can help you build more efficient infrastructure. They also have their own custom software that they've written, which is a complete cost optimization platform for Google Cloud, and that's available at reoptimize.io as a free service if you want to check out what Doit International is capable of building. Doit International are experts in cloud cost optimization, and if you're spending more than $10,000, you can get a free assessment by going to doit-intl.com slash se daily and see how much money you can save on your cloud deployment lynn clark welcome to software engineering daily thank you so much for having me on you're an engineer at mozilla and you have been working on WebAssembly. you've written some excellent posts that describe how WebAssembly works. I want to start by talking about JavaScript in the browser, because I think that will gradually get us towards the motivation for WebAssembly and what it actually is. So when JavaScript first came out, what did the browser do to process it? Well, initially, browsers used interpreters. And I want to explain a little bit about what an interpreter is in case folks that are listening aren't so familiar with them. 
your browser basically needs to go from the source code, the source JavaScript code that was written by the developer, and turn it into machine code that your computer actually understands. So this is how running an application in your browser is different from installing that same application on your computer. When you install the application on your computer, what you have is compiled code. It's already machine code. But when it's coming into your browser, it's in a human readable, you know, it's the source code, and you need to translate it into the machine code. So there's this translation process that's happening in your browser. And in the early days, the browsers were doing that completely on the fly. So when you load the page, doing this translation process is part of what happens during the loading of the web page. So these browsers, they would get the file and then start going line by line and doing that translation and then running the code at the same time and executing it. And that's called uh, an interpreter when it does it on the fly. And the nice thing about an interpreter is that it starts running your code really quickly. But there's an alternate approach, an ahead of time compiler that will actually do that translation to machine code before you start running your program. And th that has the nice benefit that so if with an interpreter, if you are doing a loop, if you're in a loop, you have to keep doing that translation to machine code over and over and over again for the code that's in that loop. With an ahead of time compiler, you don't actually need to do, do the translation over and over again. You just have your already translated code that's in the loop. Right, so when people are learning to code in Java, for example, kind of reductive to or C to describe it this way, but their experience is they compile the code they, there's a compilation or objectification step, and then the code can actually run. It just it just runs. It might as well be in binary as as the programmer understands it, and it's fast. In contrast to interpreted languages, where line by line the code is is turned into executable uh, machine code, and then somewhere in between the interpretation mode of processing and the compilation mode of processing, there's the just-in-time compilation process. What is a just-in-time compiler, and when did just-in-time compilation come to JavaScript? Exactly, yeah. Just-in-time compilers were created to weigh these trade-offs. So in about 2008, both us at Firefox and the Chrome team, it was right around when Chrome was released, we were both working on just-in-time compilers. Ours was called TraceMonkey, and it came out a few weeks before Chrome's did. And the idea behind the just-in-time compiler was that first you would run the code through the interpreter, and you would see which parts of the code were being run a lot, where you would actually get a lot of performance gains from compiling that code, and uh, run it through a well, this architecture has changed a bit over the years, so I'm going to describe the architecture that most of the browsers have now. Once you run it maybe about 10 times, that's what it is for us in Firefox, then the parts that have been run you know, 10 times or more will be sent to a baseline compiler. And that baseline compiler is going to compile to machine code and store it. So for a function it'll, we'll, it, that's being called more than 10 times, it will compile that to machine code and store it. And it will actually do this because you have to have different compiled versions for different types. When you have a string passed into a function, the compiled code you get for it is gonna be different than when you have a number passed into that same function. So you'll need to have two stubs, two bits of compiled code. It's called with either of those types. So that's what the baseline compiler does. Once and the interpreter will keep or the, the JIT will keep monitoring to see how often the functions are called. If they get called a whole lot, I think for us in Firefox, it may be a thousand or 10,000 times. Then it will go to an optimizing compiler. And the optimizing compiler will you know, take the time to figure out what the most optimal way to translate this into machine code is. Now, optimizing compilers are kind of slow because they have to take a lot of time to figure out what is the most efficient way to do this. But once they've done that and they've stored it, then they run a lot faster. The one thing about optimizing compilers is to make those kinds of shortcuts, to make those kinds of optimizations, you really need to have fixed types. And so optimizing compilers will usually require that this function be called with the same types all the time. And if one call happens that's not of that type, then the optimizing compiler will actually throw out the compiled code that is compiled. 
and start monitoring again to see if it should optimize this function again. It will check, keep checking the types. But this process can actually end up slowing down your code if it happens enough times, if you keep optimizing and then throwing out the code that you've optimized. So there can be some real trade-offs to weigh here. So originally, JavaScript was just interpreted, and this is suboptimal because the code has to be reinterpreted every time a loop runs. So if you have a for loop, and it's going to run 10 times, in the naively interpreted world, it's just going to be converted to binary 10 different times, which is pretty expensive. And a just-in-time compiler can improve that by understanding that the code is going to be executing 10 times, so we can just compile it to binary and then rerun it 10 different times, which is going to be an optimization. But the downside is that this just-in-time compiler has to do a lot of overhead. It has to be very aware of what is going on in the code path. So it needs to understand what is a hot code path. And I, I think if I understood you correctly, you were alluding to the fact that this is actually harder to do in an untyped language like JavaScript, because it's harder to make a smart compiler when you have untyped code, because the, the system has to kind of infer what type something is when it's doing the compilation. Am I understanding things correctly? For the most part, yes. The fact that JavaScript is untyped is a, a part of why it's slower than it could be. Um, the heart of the matter is the dynamic types. The fact that the types of variables can change at any time is the real problem there because that optimizing compiler, if it could depend on when it sees this function being called with a string or with a number, that it will always be called with a string or a number, you would just need to monitor the first time it was called. And then you could actually optimize based on whatever it was called with. You could see what the type coming in was at that point. But in JavaScript, you can't make those kinds of assumptions because it could be called with a number 10,000 times and then called with a string the 10,000th and first time. So that is where you get into those optimization and re-optimization bailing out is what it's called, where you bail out and re-optimize over and over again, and that can be a performance cliff. And also with JavaScript, because you can have the, the type changing on you, you have to add these guards. You actually have to check the types that are coming in before you pull out a compiled bit of code and make sure that they're, the types are the same as what you expect. And those guards can be expensive too. So one way of looking at the WebAssembly project is is that it's going to get us to a, a way of executing code in the browser faster. Another way of looking at it is that it's going to get us to a place where we can execute different languages in the browser other than JavaScript. As we move towards a conversation about WebAssembly, how does the past of how JavaScript in the browser has evolved, how does that inform where we got to with the browser vendors deciding, okay, we need to start working on this WebAssembly thing? Well, WebAssembly was very informed by the history of the web. That is very true. There were a couple of different approaches that different browser vendors were pursuing around the same time. So at Mozilla, we had this thing called ASM.js, which was basically taking that problem that JavaScript had of these dynamic types and saying if, that in ASM.js, you would just use a character to say, no, this isn't a dynamic type. This is just a number. This is just an integer. And by signaling to the engine that this is not dynamically typed, then the engine could make those optimizations, do those shortcuts. And so that was the seed for WebAssembly. There was also another project going on at Google at the same, same time called Knackle or Pinnacle that was kind of similar in its aims, but was a slightly less web focused. It didn't build so much on existing web technologies. So once we had ASM.js, we proved that it could be done. We started talking with the other browsers, with the folks on the Pinnacle team, and seeing, could we do something that takes this basic principle of reducing the dynamism of those types? And could we use it in the same way as we would use JavaScript, where you ship it down, you, know, you fetch it, you execute it in the VM, in the browser? But 
it gives you this speed, this performance, predictable performance that you don't have with JavaScript usually. So when we're talking about other languages that we would want to run in the browser, what's a concrete example of something from a language outside of JavaScript that I would want to run in the browser? There are a bunch of different examples. The earliest examples were PC games. So one of the reasons that was a really good use case for WebAssembly is because when you have animations in games, you really are very sensitive to making sure that you get the frame rate correct, that you aren't dropping frames. Because if you drop frames, that makes your animation really jumpy. And that's not a great game experience. And so the PC game industry was the first partner that we worked with when we were working on WebAssembly. But there are lots of applications that can benefit from this kind of performance, from this ability to have consistent performance and to manage memory directly instead of through JavaScript's memory management. One application that you could see coming to the web is something like Adobe's Photoshop. That would make it possible for you to, instead of installing Photoshop on your computer, just have, fire it up on the web whenever you wanted. And these other kinds of large applications that you traditionally think of as applications you have to install are applications you could in the future see being web applications. Actually, that's an incredible example because I use a, a program for writing music on the computer and it's it's a mostly, I think it's a C++ application and writing music on the computer is something that the browsers have not been able to do I think for the very same reasons that you can't run Photoshop in the browser. That is exactly correct. Yes, that industry, the folks that make those tools for making music are really starting to get very interested in WebAssembly. I think that it's a company called Propellerheads maybe recently released some of their tools in browser versions. And the great thing about WebAssembly is that they can just take their existing code base take all of the business logic, all of that backend stuff, compile that to WebAssembly, and then put an HTML and CSS front end on top of that, which often is actually easier to work with than the toolkits that you're using for user interfaces in their native applications. So it actually not just makes it available more widely, but also can be a better developer experience. At Software Engineering Daily, we're always analyzing data to determine what our listeners care about. And we actually have a lot of data, even though we're just a podcast. So it always reminds me that organizations with much more engineering going on have an order of magnitude more data than a podcast like Software Engineering Daily. And that's why the job of a data scientist is such a good job to get. Flatiron School is training the next generation of data scientists and helping them land jobs. Flatiron School is an outcomes-focused coding boot camp that offers transformative education in person and online. Flatiron School's data science program is a 15-week curriculum that mixes software engineering, statistical understanding, and the ability to apply both skills in real-life scenarios. All of the career-changing courses include money-back guarantees. If you don't get a job in six months, Flatiron School will refund your tuition, and you can visit their website for details. As a Software Engineering Daily listener, you can start learning for free at flatironschool.com slash sedaily. You can get $500 off your first month of Flatiron School's online data science boot camp, and you can get started with transforming your career towards data science. Go to flatironschool.com slash sedaily and get $500 off your first month of their online data science course. Thanks to Flatiron School for being a new sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. As we move towards a conversation around how this kind of code is going to execute in the browser, how C++ code or Rust code is going to execute in the browser, we need to have a conversation about intermediate languages and virtual machines. So different programming environments have implemented virtual machines. So Java bytecode, for example, there's a virtual machine 
where your Java code compiles down into bytecode, and then that bytecode gets com- compiled into machine code, if I, if I understand it correctly. And then there's this huge ecosystem around other languages that's called the JVM ecosystem, other languages such as Clojure or Scala that compile into JVM code. And so you get kind of economies of scale because people make optimizations to the JVM and that ends up optimizing all of these different languages that can compile to to JVM code. And you saw a similar phenomenon with LLVM, that's another virtual machine ecosystem. This idea of the intermediate language, the intermediate bytecode representation and the virtual machine that can run that intermediate language, what are the advantages of that? What are the advantages of having this intermediate runtime? Well, intermediate languages and intermediate representations actually have a long history. Even preceding things like Java, they were used in compilers as a way to make it easier to reuse different parts of the compiler. So early compilers, you would have to write a new compiler when you wanted to go from one programming language to a particular target architecture, because different devices have different machine codes that they understand. The machine code that runs on your phone is gonna be different than the machine code that runs on your computer, probably. So that's why, you know, when you're going to download a program from the internet, it will ask you, do you want the Mac version or the Windows version? Because they actually speak different machine code languages. So when you're writing a program in a source language and you want to compile to a particular machine code language, early on, you would have to have a specific compiler for each pair. But what having an intermediate representation does is it makes it so that you can compile from your source code into the intermediate representation. And then that single intermediate representation can go to any one of the different machine code targets that the compiler targets. And so that gives you a lot more reusability. You can have the thing that goes from source to the intermediate representation, that's called a front end. So you can have a bunch of different front ends for different languages. And then the thing that goes from the intermediate representation down to the machine code, that's called a backend. So that is why you have these. And then they were used also for virtual machines, for these things that don't necessarily compile ahead of time, but actually compile uh, that are running your code at runtime. Why is it beneficial? Why would I want to go to an intermediate language? Why would I want to go from Java to the JVM instead of going from Java straight to the processor's language or go from Rust to the LLVM instead of going Rust directly to the processor? Well, like I did mention, it gives you the ability to have one tool chain. So if you write a front end that can go from Rust to a particular intermediate representation, then you can go from that intermediate representation to all of the different processors, all of the different machine codes that particular compiler supports. So it gives you that extensibility. But there's also, for in the case of language agnostic compilers, things like LLVM, the nice thing is that there are, these, there are these optimizations that happen when it's in the intermediate representation. And because they're language agnostic, they can be applied to code that's written in all different kinds of languages. So you get to reuse those optimizations across different programming languages as well. So we're going to eventually get to WebAssembly, but LLVM, well, it is the first intermediate language that can translate into WebAssembly, or at least that the browser vendors and the other people who are working on WebAssembly are trying to get implemented. So they're trying to build a way to convert LLVM code into WebAssembly code. And WebAssembly code is code that can run in a very performant fashion in the browser. First of all, did I get that right? Is that the right way of of articulating it? Well, LLVM actually does support this at this point. It's less that we're actively working on making it work, as and now it's more optimizing things. So LLVM can already target WebAssembly. Rust is actually using it as their backend um, to go from Rust to WebAssembly. Okay, so I could go from Rust to the LLVM, and then from the LLVM to the WebAssembly and run my Rust code in the browser today. Yes, you can do that. So this is work that is currently in progress. There are still a few things that kinks that need to be ironed out. But if you're adventuresome, you can try it out. And it is running in production in a number of different tools. So for example, the source maps 
well, the source maps JavaScript library that is used in tools like Webpack and in our Firefox developer tools. That currently has some Rust compiled to WebAssembly that sped up performance by a great deal. There's a great article by Nick Fitzgerald on exactly how that optimization happened, which I can add a link to the show notes. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. The process of going from LLVM to WebAssembly, this is going from one intermediate language to another, right? Because WebAssembly itself is an intermediate language before hitting the uh, the compiler's instruction set. Is, it, is that right? It's kind of hard to exactly pin down what WebAssembly is because WebAssembly, you could, sh- could really think of it as an ISA in and of itself, but it's just a ISA for a virtual machine, not for an actual physical machine. Mm. But it's fairly low level. I, I would consider it lower level than LLVM's intermediate representation. I see. And so so you want to get there as opposed to, you want to get to this other instruction set, the WebAssembly instruction set, rather than going getting the I, LLVM intermediate representation because it's going to be even more highly optimized. It, it, for example, it would not be a viable solution to the problems of running code in the web to just say let's let's try to build LLVM for the web like what would be the what to take the kind of um, counterfactual but what would be the problems with trying to implement just like the LLVM in the browser well you know what it's funny they actually did consider that and so if you look uh, I think in the facts for WebAssembly the maybe in the design repo there is a question of exactly that. Why not just use LLVM's intermediate representation? So I'd say that there are a couple of reasons why it's better. WebAssembly is better than just shipping down LLVM's IR. One of them is that because WebAssembly is, we kind of know what we want to do. We, we have kind of a more restricted problem set. Some of the WebAssembly stuff has been tailored. Some of the instructions, the way it runs, have been tailored for performance, particularly in these virtual machines that are running this code. But more importantly, I think LLVM's intermediate representation would just be a lot larger. It's not as compact. WebAssembly was designed to be compact. And so that is important because part of the user's experience of download of uh, loading a page is the downloading of the files. And I think that downloading a byte of code is something like a hundred times more battery intensive than parsing that same byte of code. <laughs> Don't quote me on that because I've never actually checked that. It's, it's, I'm sure it's directionally right. <laughs> so you really want to minimize that cost of downloading. So WebAssembly is quite compact and a lot more compact than LLVM's IR would be. Fascinating. And, and one direction this takes us is that this makes there be an incentive or, or maybe that there already was an incentive that I'm, I'm not aware of, but it gives an incentive for people to write C and C++ compilers to the intermediate representation of LLVM because the toolchain work has been done on LLVM to WebAssembly. So if people want to get their C++ code running in the browser, it first has to hit LLVM code. Well, you know what? There are actually other toolkits that are currently being worked on as well. We're working on one. Um, so besides LLVM, there's one called Binarian. And it has an intermediate representation that's similar to WebAssembly, but not identical to it. And it's easier to optimize um, for WebAssembly on that. One of the nice things about it is that it's language agnostic. So it's a lots of language agnostic optimizations. um, And it's particularly a lot easier for uh, high level garbage collected language languages to target it. Now, WebAssembly doesn't have support for garbage collection for integration with the browser's own garbage collection quite yet, but it's actively, very actively being worked on in the WebAssembly community group. So having a tool like Binarian, which is good for those kinds of languages and is optimized for compiling to WebAssembly, could be a really good, we could see this maybe as being the LLVM for those kinds of languages. LLVM to WebAssembly, that is a compilation step that has been figured out. Now it's being optimized. Somebody could conceivably write a JVM to WebAssembly uh, transpilation process, right? Java is probably going to be one of the harder languages to make work in WebAssembly. I don't know that I can actually, I'm not the <laughs> best person for explaining why That's that okay. is. <laughs> I can give you a pass but, on that. 
<laughs> but we don't think that that one's going to be one of the ones that can easily target WebAssembly. Someone's going to do it. <laughs> it sounds like a yeah, someone. <laughs> I, I think it's actually already being worked on by adventuresome people. But I think that because of some of the garbage collection language features, I think there might be a difference in the way that finalizers are being specced currently versus the way that Java requires uses them. But like I said, I'm not the best person to talk about those details. <laughs> okay, and so and I guess this is this is an interesting point. So because so the main languages that people are working on getting their code from like current client side applications into the browser today are I guess C and C and Rust. And these are not garbage collected languages. These are languages where you manually manage the memory. And this is one thing we want out of our WebAssembly modules, right? If we're building a browser-based application, we want to make a call to this compiled WebAssembly module. It's been compiled into WebAssembly. And we want this thing to, this little module that we're going to be calling to manage its own memory, right? Well, there is a linear memory, this, this basically array of bytes that emulates the heap in a WebAssembly module. So that is definitely what people use today for managing state in WebAssembly modules. But part of the integration that we are working on with garbage collection in the browser will also give WebAssembly developers the ability to work with managed objects from JavaScript. And the idea is that you'd be able to use them both, these objects across the boundary, you'd be able to use them both in JavaScript and WebAssembly. So eventually, you will be able to have a WebAssembly module that doesn't necessarily manage any stuff in linear memory. But linear memory is definitely a big part of, you know, that, that manual memory management is definitely a big part of WebAssembly today, yes. Mm. Right. So, and for people who don't know, I, th I think this is, this is accurate, but JavaScript, it's a garbage collected language. And so you're not manually managing memory that your application is just the memory management is taken care of by, I guess, the JavaScript engine or? Yes. Yeah. The JavaScript engine will figure out if you still have things in scope. And if you don't, it'll clean them out for you. So this topic of a JavaScript engine, we probably should have defined this earlier. So there are different JavaScript engines. There's V8 on Chrome. And then I think on Firefox, is, does Firefox use, is it SpiderMonkey? Yeah, we have SpiderMonkey. And then Edge has Chakra and uh, V8 has JSC. Got it. Okay. So so that's like four major JavaScript engines. What's the spec for a JavaScript engine? What does a JavaScript engine have to do for you in the browser? Oh, the JavaScript spec is very large. It's hard to encapsulate in a quick answer. But basically, what happens when your code comes in is that it will be parsed into an abstract syntax tree. And then that abstract syntax tree will be a lot of times turned into what's called a byte code. So like you said, like an intermediate representation. And then that bytecode will be executed by the interpreter or compiled. So anybody who has worked at a company that's building a web application has gone through this, this torturous process of testing on different browsers. Like they'll be like, why doesn't my application run the same in, in all these different browsers? Is it running different in different browsers because the JavaScript engine that's running in each given browser is making subjective decisions. It's making like a different decisions around how to run that same web application. Is it the JavaScript engine that's making that, that different decision? So yes, the different JavaScript engines, if you see something that's acting differently in JavaScript across different browser engines, that's because the implementations are different. And usually it's that one of them has a bug. It's usually the fact, the case that one of them is not spec compliant or compliant with the specification. And the reason that this happens is because one of these engines might have done an optimization to make things run faster, but that optimization might end up breaking things in the process. So it's usually the case that you want to, if you find one of these issues, you can actually, we have a web compatibility group at Mozilla, and you can file issues on their repo saying, I see this different behavior in these different browsers. Can you fix it. And those folks will figure out which of the browsers is not acting in a spec compliant way and put a issue on the right repo on the right issue tracker. And so because there are different JavaScript engines in each of these different browsers, 
there's going to be some different opportunities for how WebAssembly could be implemented in these different engines, right? Or, or is, there a, is this an opportunity to actually create some standardization around how WebAssembly is implemented? I would say both is actually true. We are all implementing our WebAssembly support independently. So you do still have opportunities for there to be these differences, and there definitely have been these differences between different browsers. At the same time, because WebAssembly itself doesn't require as many of, many of these optimizations, and it certainly doesn't require as much guessing and checking kind of optimizations, that makes it more consistent. It's easier to implement WebAssembly as a compiler developer than it is to implement JavaScript. So it reduces the number of these compatibility issues. Okay. So we need to be able to compile the LLVM intermediate representation into WebAssembly files. And as you've said, this is this part has been accomplished but it's it's not completely optimized as it is as it stands today. What's hard about that the process of writing a uh, LLVM intermediate representation to WebAssembly compiler? I don't know that it's actually that difficult. I think it's more that because WebAssembly is just so young, it doesn't have the accretion of the optimizations that have happened over years for targeting other ISAs. So. I think that it's more just a matter of WebAssembly needs to mature than there's anything inherent to WebAssembly that makes it difficult. So let's imagine we've got that whole compiler tool chain in our browsers today. Is it in the browser today? Like, can, I, can Rust actually run in my browser today? Yeah, like I mentioned, that source maps library that we have ported somewhat to from JavaScript to Rust, that's actually running in browsers today. A number of different code bases are running in browsers today. So let's give the the full soup to nuts explanation. If I'm going to get Rust code deployed in my browser, running on an application, what's the whole tool chain look like? Getting Rust into the intermediate representation, then to WebAssembly, and then eventually into my browser. Just kind of give an overview, and then we'll dive into it in more detail. Okay, well, there's, I think, two different overviews I can give you. For your super simple Hello World, all you need to do is compile your Rust file, or your, your Rust project, with the Rust compiler and with a flag. I think it's target unknown unknown WASM or some, I forget the exact compiler flag, but that will give you a hello world. You can actually even do this without downloading the compiler, without installing the compiler through a tool that we have called WebAssembly Studio. And that's an online IDE for playing around with compiling to WebAssembly. So if you just go to WebAssembly Studio, start a new Rust project and hit build and run, that will run that in the browser for you. Now, if you have a more serious project, the tools you're going to use for that are somewhat different. We are working on trying to make it as easy for developers to incorporate WebAssembly modules, Rust to WebAssembly modules into their development workflows. So the tools that we're working on for that are, there's this one called WASM BindGen, because one of the issues that you have when you're working with WebAssembly is that currently the only types that you can pass into functions or that you can get as results from functions are integers or floats. So that's not super useful for certain different kinds of computation. You might want to have something like a string. WASM bind gen will help you. It will basically wrap your code in things that can turn your string into numbers, put it into the linear memory that goes into WebAssembly. And then when you get a return from WebAssembly that's a string, it will take the numbers out of the linear memory and turn them back into a string. So we have you know, tools for making that a lot more ergonomic for the users. Then there's another tool we have called WASM Pack that automates the process of packaging up your WebAssembly, your Rust to WebAssembly project and pushing it up to NPM. And then we're also working with the different bundlers to make it easy for those bundlers to bring WebAssembly modules into JavaScript projects. So that's the tool chain that you would be using if you're doing something more advanced than just a hello world. Mm -hmm. 
stop wasting engineering time and cycles on fixing security holes way too late in the software development lifecycle. Start with a secure foundation before coding starts. Active State gives your engineers a way to bake security into your language's runtime. Ensure security and compliance at runtime. A snapshot of information about your application is sent to the Active State platform. Package names, versions, and licenses, and the snapshot is sent each time the application is run or a new package is loaded so that you identify security vulnerabilities and out-of-date packages and restrictive licenses, such as the GPL or the LPGL license, and you identify those things before it becomes a problem. You can get more information at activestate.com slash sedaily. You want to make sure that your application is secure and compliant, and Active State goes a long way at helping prevent those kinds of troublesome issues from emerging too late in the software development process. So check it out at activestate.com slash sedaily if you think you might be having issues with security or compliance. Thank you to Active State for being a new sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. Interesting. So the the last mile there. So if I get my C or C plus plus or Rust module compiled and ready to deploy to a web application, it still needs to be pulled into the web application. And I think you said you mentioned something about npm integration there. So what's the process of getting a module, a, a double WebAssembly module that has been compiled from C or C plus plus or Rust? pulled into the web application? What's the process at the last mile? Well, it's really very similar to a JavaScript module. You add it to your package.json file, and the bundlers are supporting something that's not quite natively supported in the browser yet. I'm actually championing this project through the WebAssembly community group and TC39. And the project is to make it possible to load WebAssembly modules using the ES module syntax. The reason why that's nice is because one, it gives you an easier way to instantiate WebAssembly modules than we have today. Today, you actually have to do this a bit of boilerplate with JavaScript to instantiate a WebAssembly module. So with this, you'll be able to just say import function, you know, foo or whatever from bar.wasm, just as you do with a JavaScript module. So that's one benefit is that it gives you that better ergonomics. It also allows you to then use the WebAssembly module in the same way that you'd use a JavaScript module and use them in the same module graph as other JavaScript modules. So your users might not actually realize that they're using a WebAssembly module or a JavaScript module. They would just be importing and exporting as they normally would. What's the interface between somebody who has written a JavaScript application and they now want to use a WebAssembly module How are they interfacing with that WebAssembly module? How are they calling it? There are a few answers to this. You might have some people, so if you're developing a WebAssembly module, you might want to give a JavaScript API. So you might wrap it in JavaScript so that it will handle converting data and stuff like that. But if you're just working with numbers, then you could just have import, you know, random or whatever from foo.wasm and then just call the function the same way that you would with JavaScript, passing in numbers. When that WebAssembly module is loaded, I know it's given a fixed space of memory. What else goes on? What's like the the bootstrapping and the, the instantiation, the allocation process of that module getting called? So you have different kinds of imports that you can pass into a module. You can have, you can pass in things like values. And I shouldn't say pass in, you can import things like values. And those will be globals within that module scope. So when you're instantiating, you pass in all of those things that you want to be a part of the module. So those are the imports like you would have in JavaScript. Those get allocated, but not in the linear memory. So with linear memory, the program, the code that's actually in the WebAssembly module in the functions can really read and write that memory at will. They can see the bytes there. Um, The imports that get passed in, 
the WebAssembly functions can actually see the bytes directly for that. But during the process of loading, you will set aside, the, you know, allocate those values, and then you will instantiate the linear memory. So create that object that is that array of bytes. And if the module had any preset data that should go in that memory, that will be stuffed into that linear memory. You can also have these things called tables, which will get initialized during this point. I won't go into depth on those because they're a little bit more of an edge case at this point. And then once that's all done, it will call what's called the start function. So that is, if you're coming from JavaScript, it's like the top level code. It's the code that's outside of functions in JavaScript, the code that gets run immediately after the module has been instantiated. But that's pretty much it. Once that is all done, then the only way that the WebAssembly starts doing anything is if you actually call the functions that it exports. These WebAssembly modules that get instantiated in my browser, they're operating within a stack-based virtual machine. So this is a virtual machine that's super minimal. It's super low footprint, just like if anybody has taken a, a course in electrical engineering or just you know computer architecture where you learn about how these the processor instruction sets work. I mean, I, I think people who are curious about that can can look into that. It's it's pretty interesting. Uh, not super relevant if you're a high level software engineer, except to know like why this kind of system actually runs quite efficiently, even though it sounds kind of lame. It's like you know you're doing stuff with registers, I think, uh, and you have you have to do everything in a stack. Are all of these modules are they self managing, or is there some overseer? that's managing all your different WebAssembly modules that are instantiated in the browser? Well, I'd say that your overseer is actually JavaScript. JavaScript is the one that, at least currently, is is you're using a JavaScript API to load the WebAssembly module and then to call any functions on that WebAssembly module. Now, that will change probably when we get the ES module support, because then you'd be able to have a script type equals module and foo.wasm. And you may not have any JavaScript in there. Currently, if you did that, then you wouldn't actually have any side effects in the browser. You wouldn't actually be able to see it doing anything. So that would be kind of useless. But once you can actually pass DOM functions and all of that kind of stuff into WebAssembly functions that could then call them, you could see the possibility of having a whole module graph of WebAssembly modules that doesn't require any real JavaScript. Which is pretty incredible to think about. You talked in your, in your post about how JavaScript can call WebAssembly modules, and then WebAssembly modules can also call out to JavaScript. Why would you want to do that? Why would you want to have... I mean, because I can see how... You know, I could write a web application where I would want to delegate functionality to WebAssembly modules to do low-level operations or to run Photoshop. But why would I want Photoshop to be able to call back out to JavaScript? Well, currently, you actually do need to call back out to JavaScript for a lot of things because WebAssembly doesn't actually have direct DOM access. So if you want to make a change to something in the DOM, you need to call a function from JavaScript that can make that change in the DOM for you. I mentioned we're working on making it so that you can pass, you know, built-ins from the web platform or uh, you know different kinds of DOM objects into a WebAssembly function, and then use those directly from WebAssembly. So in that case, you wouldn't necessarily need to call a JavaScript function in order to do that for you. But for now, you'll you do have WebAssembly functions calling JavaScript functions a lot for that kind of, you know, side effecty kind of stuff. When do we start to see WebAssembly impacting the average user and affecting the average user's application experience? Well, when you're talking about the average user, do you mean the average person who's browsing to web pages or the average developer? Let's give both timelines. So the average user, you're already seeing it in a lot of applications. I think, I can't remember, Google Earth I know is at least working on using WebAssembly. I can't remember if they're using it, um, but AutoCAD has released their CAD software in the browser. So a lot of people, like I mentioned, we have the source maps library in our developer tools that's using WebAssembly. So a lot of users are being impacted by the use of WebAssembly without realizing that they're using WebAssembly. 
for developers, I think that it's probably going to be fairly similar. A lot of developers are going to end up using WebAssembly without realizing that they're using WebAssembly because a package that they depend on, like the source maps library, is using WebAssembly under the hood. I should have asked this earlier, but are there additional security considerations that WebAssembly introduces to to the web developer or or I guess to the to the browser vendors? You know, WebAssembly, interestingly enough, it's actually interesting in kind of the opposite way. It actually can close security holes. And it's being considered for cases where you want to run untrusted code, but, you know, code that you're downloading at random from the internet, but don't want to give access to your system's resources. Now, people have had concerns that WebAssembly would open up an attack surface, but it uses the same concept that JavaScript does. You know, it basically uses all of the same security modeling that JavaScript does. So, and the reason that JavaScript has, you know, some pretty, the browser vendors have really worked on making JavaScript secure to run is because you are downloading this untrusted code from who knows what kind of person. And you don't want that person to be able to take care, take over your system. So that's why, for example, the linear memory is not really people, when they hear that you have direct memory access with WebAssembly, they are concerned that the attacker is going to be able to get access to like the global object or something like that. But WebAssembly doesn't have access to random parts of the platform. The only thing that WebAssembly has access to is that linear memory, which is just an array of bytes. So it's an array buffer, which you know, you already have in JavaScript. And anytime somebody tries to access something outside of that array buffer, there's an array bounds check that will throw an exception, it will trap whenever WebAssembly module tries to access memory outside of its array buffer, it's a linear memory. And as far as functions that you can call, you only can call the things that get passed into WebAssembly, either, you know, as imports or as uh, function arguments. And that means that you can't just reach out and touch random parts of the platform. You're being, as a developer who's working with a WebAssembly module, you're intentionally giving them exactly the access that you want, exactly the functions that you want this module to use. To talk about one of the broader implications for WebAssembly, and I do want to start to zoom out because I know we're, we're running out of time here, but the idea of using a wider variety of languages in the browser is very exciting. And you wrote that a goal for 2018, one of your goals is to make Rust more of a web language. Why is Rust a good complement to JavaScript? How do you see it fitting into the web? Well, I should clarify that that is actually my goal. It's also the goal of the entire Rust to WebAssembly team. And that work is being led by uh, folks like Nick Fitzgerald, who worked on that source maps library that I was talking about, um, Ashley Williams, who is working on WASM Pack, Alex Crichton, who's working on WASM BindGen. So a lot of those folks are really driving this work to make Rust a more more of a web language. And the reason why Rust is really suited to be a web language is really going to be a very good tool in web developers' toolboxes is that there are some problems that system programming languages are better suited for. So like there are times when managing your own memory yourself is going to be a lot more performant than allowing the JavaScript engine to create objects willy-nilly and just letting the JavaScript engine clean them up for you. But managing memory is as a developer is really pretty hard. And if you get it wrong, you can open up some pretty big security issues. So Rust is nice because it was designed in a way that allows you to manage your memory yourself, but also guards you from the kinds of memory safety bugs that open up these security issues. So the reason that this is good for the web and good for web developers is because a lot of web developers don't have the time to really learn about you know C and C++ proper memory handling. And Rust gives you a way to get that performance of a systems programming language without giving you the foot gun that programming language like C or C++ might. I haven't built many web applications, but I imagine that memory leaks can be or be a less a less significant issue if you're working with a language like Rust that emphasizes the memory management. That's true. One thing with WebAssembly is if you have a memory leak, that memory leak will only impact your module because of that the fact that you have that kind of sequestered off linear memory. But yes, it, within your module, that memory leak will be better with something like Rust. This is, this is a world that seems like so different than what web development looks like 
today because it, it you know the kind of the, the early examples we're talking about with let's get Photoshop in the browser or let's get AutoCAD in the browser because these are kind of our our best projections of the present day applications and how they would fit into the browser. But undeniably, the coolest applications of WebAssembly are going to be the ones that we're not thinking of today. And But you're thinking of it from a more fundamental perspective. If you get Rust in the browser, what do you get? What's the state of tooling around WebAssembly? So if I'm a developer that's not on the cutting edge, my younger brother, for example, is always tinkering with whatever new thing has made it to the top of Hacker News today. You know, it's building a Flutter app, he's probably doing something in WebAssembly, and why not? And people are like that. But the average developer is probably waiting a little bit for the tooling to develop. So what's the tooling that you see as barriers between the super cutting edge developers and the average developer? Well, I think we're getting there as far as tooling that you can produce WebAssembly, a solid WebAssembly program with. Like I said, the Rust team has really been working on this a lot this year. They're going to be working on it through the rest of the year, very, you know, going even more heads down on this. The problem that we have, the area that I think needs the most work is in debugging. And that is something that is actively being worked on. But it's just kind of hard to find a way to represent the debugging information. There's been some thinking that we can piggyback on source maps, and there's been some work around that. But source maps might just not we may never be able to get all the way there with source maps. So there's also discussions about, should we use something based on this thing called dwarf? I have to say, I'm not actually that well-versed in the distinctions for these different debugging tools. But I think that that is the area that's probably going to hold back developers who are a little bit more cautious. Okay, I know we're at the end of our time, but I just want to ask you, what about progressive web applications? Do you think WebAssembly will make progressive web applications more compelling? I do think so, because I think that, you know, WebAssembly gets you closer to the performance of native code. And that's why a lot of people who have developed platform-specific mobile applications have done that, is because they want that speed. But with a PWA, you have the ease of installation of a web app, or you know, no installation really, that a web app has. But if you're using WebAssembly, then you can get close to the performance of that native application still. Um, and it also makes the transition from a native mobile code base to a web code base easier, because you can take all of the logic that you have in your native app written in something like Swift and just reuse it. Oh, wow. And in the, if you compile it to WebAssembly, then you can just reuse all of that code that you already have. All you need to do is put a new front end on using web technologies, so new HTML and CSS. But that a lot of times, I mentioned this before with the propeller heads example, a lot of times using the HTML and CSS for your user interface is actually better than the toolkits that you're given. Yeah, look at Electron. Yeah, exactly. So I think that this definitely makes using web technologies a much better choice for these native experiences or for these mobile experiences. I did a show, a couple shows about Flutter recently, and there it sounds like Google is really trying to get away from the JVM for their mobile application. So I, w- I wonder if if Flutter and Dart gets them closer to this this same world where progressive web apps could, could be doable. I do know that the Dart folks have been talking about WebAssembly. And so I could see them possibly ending up using WebAssembly as part of their story as well. Okay. Well, Lynn, thank you so much for coming back on the show. And your posts were super helpful for for me understanding WebAssembly. It's taken like three or four at bats for me, like sitting down and saying, I'm going to understand what this thing does. And I think I got the closest with your article. So thank you so much. Oh, well, thank you. I'm so happy to hear that. Thank you so much. Over the last two years, I spent much of my time building a video product. We had issues with latency, unreliable video playback, codecs. I was amazed that it was so difficult to work with videos. As it turns out, video is complex. And figuring out how to optimize the delivery of video is not easy especially since there is both mobile and desktop, and mobile users might not have as much bandwidth as desktop users. If you're an engineer working on a product that involves video, you just don't want to think about any of this. I can tell you that from firsthand experience. And that's why Mux exists. 
Check out mux.com and find out how Mux makes it easy to upload and playback video. Mux makes video hosting and streaming simple, and today you can get $50 in free credit by mentioning SE Daily in the sign-up process. Even if you aren't working on video right now, if you think you might work with video in the future, Mux is a really useful tool to be aware of. Check out mux.com, and if you're an engineer who's looking for work, you can also apply for a job at mux.com. On Software Engineering Daily, we've done two shows with Mux, and I know that Mux is solving some big, difficult problems involving lots of data and large video files. To find out more, you can go to mux.com. You can get $50 in free credit by mentioning SE Daily, and you can apply for a job if you're interested in working on some of these large challenges. Thanks to Mux for being a sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. Wow! 